Good Wednesday evening, everybody. Welcome back to Music Notes Midweek. Um, I'm Kathy Youngblood, and Sarah Terrell is here with me, and we are here to lead you in, in worship. Uh, we're going to talk tonight about God's faithfulness. And we're going to start out with a song about uh, God's character, His love, that God is love. And um, the poem is uh, so deep, it has some wonderful imagery in it. Um, but join us now in singing The Love of God. grace is enough. Great is your faithfulness, O God, and even when there are thorns in our flesh, God's grace is enough. Thank you. 
Well, hello again, friends. Uh, with the magic of video editing, we are now on my back porch. Welcome, glad that you're here, glad to be with you. This week, we are gonna take a look at Psalm 126, 126. So if you have a Bible app on your phone or your computer, or you have a, a paper Bible handy, I just would encourage you to turn to Psalm 126 and to read along with me, and then just to keep it open as we're, as we're talking about it. It goes like this, Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, we are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. So it's a short little psalm. It's only six verses. Uh, but I think that there's a lot going on in there. <clears throat> and the way I see it, it is in two parts. And so the first part is memory and remembering um, from verse one to verse three, where the people are in want and they are remembering a time in their past when the Lord uh, had restored their fortunes to them and they were no longer in want and they were happy and they were quick to praise the Lord for the great things that he had done and the way that he had provided for them. Uh, but now they are not in that place. They are now in a, in a period of want again. And I think that um, when we're looking at this passage, one of the key words to, to focus on is the word restored. So they are remembering a time when the Lord restored them, meaning that they were in a time of want and then they were restored to a time of plenty. But now they're in a time of want again, remembering that previous time of plenty. And I think that that's important because this is not a situation of uh, we have everything, everything is perfect, and then we suddenly lose everything. But it's more um, one of those things where it's a it's our cyclical human existence um, in our in our sinful world state where we are not in perfect communion with God, and so we do have times of plenty and times of want, and this is a very um, a very natural order of things uh, in in our world as it is. <clears throat> And right now we are experiencing, I think one of those times of want. Uh, we are in a global crisis at the moment and much that we held dear uh, has been lost and we're operating from a place of uncertainty as to what is going to uh, come, what, what our future holds for us. And I was reading an article the other day in the Harvard Business Review um, and, it, and it says that this feeling, this collective feeling, this emotion that we're having as a world um, can be described as grief. And um, I, I, I totally think that that is accurate. Um, like the Israelites, we grieve over what has been lost. And we can even experience anticipatory grief over the loss that we know is still coming um, and the uncertainty of what comes next. And I think that the feeling of grief, the emotion of grief is very natural and a very human reaction to loss. But I also think that it's a very godly reaction to loss. I mean, we are told that God understands the feeling of grief, um, that he knew the gr deepest grief of all when uh, Christ was on the cross and the full weight of the sin of the world was on him and God had to be separated from him and the, and the grief that that caused both of them. So. Um, it gives me some comfort to know that Christ and that God the Father are acquainted with grief and that we, um, that nothing that we can experience uh, has not been experienced by them and that makes them, that puts God in a position to understand our grief. So then in part two, part two to me starts with verse four. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. 
He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. So in part two, the people are pleading with the Lord to restore their fortunes again, to bring back the richness to the land and to their lives. Um, but they're doing more than, than just pleading. They actually take action. And I want us to look at those actions. Um, in, those gr in their grief, they go out into the fields weeping, but yet still sowing the seeds for their future harvest. And there's an old saying that I think that everyone, every one of us is familiar with, and some of us may have spoken to others, um, and it's often erroneously attributed to the Bible, but it is not in the Bible. And it, it says this, it says, God helps those who helps themselves. And it's a saying that implies that God expects action on our part uh, in conjunction with his help of us. And I think that while it's true that God often asks us to move or to change or to grow, um, I think that that saying, God helps those who help themselves, has an inherent fallacy in it about the way that we think of God and the nature of God. And I think the first danger in that is that it implies that the opposite must be true. So that if God helps those who help themselves, then God doesn't help those who don't help themselves. And uh, we know that that is not the way that God operates. God is a God of grace and God is a God of mercy. And those things are, are things that are extended to us. And we have, we have the promise of those in his word. Um, the Bible is full of stories of people who have received God's unmerited favor and aid um, through no uh, great action of their own. I mean, if you just look at the book of Judges, you can find a whole book full of times that Israel pretty much shot itself in the foot repeatedly, and God repeatedly came to their aid and rescued them. Um, I think the bigger, the second and bigger danger in God helps those who help themselves is that it implies that God's aid to us is triggered by our actions and that we can do something that will cause God to do something for us, that we can manipulate God into doing what we want. And that puts us in a situation of being in control. And we are not in control of the situation. God is in control of the situation. And for me, that's a great comfort that I don't need to be in control uh, in such times as these, that I can give that control over to God. Um, so then what then is the motivation of the people in the Psalm who are going out weeping into the fields and sowing the seeds? Um, their action, I think, is not one of coercion in order to get God to help them, but it's one of faith that he has their best interest in mind and that he will provide for them. Um, he has done it before and he will do it again. So each day they go out into the fields and they place a small seed in the ground as a memory of God's goodness. And each day as they tend that little seed, they can't see what the full grown plant is going to look like. Um, there's no shiny fruit in that moment that they can reach out and grab as an instant reward. There's only the hope and the trust in God and the promise that the harvest will come again. And so this makes me ask myself, it makes me ask you, um, friends, what little seeds are you, are we planting in these days? Uh, in these days when we're in that downward cycle, what memories of good God's everlasting goodness are we sowing? So uh, in just a minute, Kathy and I are gonna sing a song that I think illustrates this point and I think illustrates Psalm 126 really beautifully. And there's a story behind it uh, that I'd like to share with you. So the writer of the song, Sarah Groves, she tells the story that she and her husband, uh, through no fault of their own, were facing financial ruin. And it looked certain that, that they were going to be ruined financially. And um, obviously she was sad. She was in grief. She was in fear about what was going to happen next. And, and, and so her natural reaction was to pour out her soul, her lament, her woe to God. And so she sat down at the piano to write a song about how, uh, how upset that she was uh, over what was happening. And she says that she heard, Scott, heard God's voice telling her 
Um, if you can remember a time in your life when I have left you high and dry, then write the song that you want to write. Write that song of woe and of lament. But if you can't, if not, if you can't remember that time when I have left you high and dry, then why not write a song of provision? And in that moment, she thought of the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And the song that eventually came out of that is a modern take on that hymn. Um, Sarah says that she's a warrior by nature and she often experiences fear and that this song holds a really special place in her heart because in the writing of it, she was able to receive the peace and the knowledge of God's faithful provision for her before she saw it in her life circumstances, before she was, before she saw it uh, in the situation of her finances being resolved, which they eventually were in this case. But this, the writing of this song was like her little small sowed seed of God, the memory of God's goodness. And I think that there's so many of us in a similar situation right now. We're facing unknowns. We're facing, uh, we may be facing our own financial ruin. Um, but in that, I want you, I want to invite you to start sowing your own seeds, to plant seeds of God, the goodness of God, um, the memory of his goodness to you. And if you're feeling afraid, if you're feeling this collective grief, uh, that our world is going through. And I know I'm, I'm in that situation. I'm going to invite you to think back on a time in your life when God really came through, through for you. I have one of those experiences in my life, and I'm sure that you have one in yours. I want you to think about that time when his provision for you was made abundantly clear. And then I'm going to challenge you to write about it or sing about it or dance about it, or make art about it, or plant a tree in memory of it. Uh, share the story with a friend. Get the word out there. Plant your own little seed. Plant the memory of God's goodness in your life and in the life of others. And let the knowledge of God's past provision bring you peace as you release your fear and your grief to him and wait with confidence for him to meet the needs of this day and this time. Thank you, friends. In just a moment, we're going to go back to the sanctuary where you will hear the song by Sarah Groves called He's Always Been Faithful. And then following that, we will have a special guest. Thanks.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Jacob Playstead. For those that don't know me, I grew up coming to this church. I live right down the street on Emory Wood, and I'm a recent graduate from Western Carolina University with a degree in vocal performance, and now I'm uh, back in Charlotte, and I'm here to sing uh, Deep River. It's a spiritual arranged by H.T. Burley. I actually sang this piece uh, a couple years ago at a concert here at St. Andrews with the Western Carolina University Concert Choir. We came and did a performance one evening, and I did uh, this piece as well as another one uh, for the congregation that night, and I hope you all enjoy it tonight. <laughs> Let's pray together. Loving God, you have reminded us time and again that you are near. You have reminded us that we need not be anxious about anything, but that we should present our requests to you with thanksgiving. So it's in that spirit tonight that we come to you first to thank you for your grace toward us and for providing for our daily needs, for walking with us through our fear and our grief, for giving us your word as a reminder of who you are. We pray for the members of our St. Andrew's family and friends who are facing health challenges, for strength, healing, and comfort in their lives. We pray for those who have lost their jobs and are facing economic uncertainty. We pray, Lord, that you would provide for their needs. We pray for those on the front line, the health care workers, nurses, doctors, allied health professionals, and researchers. Lord, inspire and strengthen them, please. We lift up those essential workers who continue to move our nation forward. And for our teachers and students who are learning that while the school year might look different, there are still opportunities to continue to lead and grow and shine and learn. We lift up our leaders in the church, in our government, 
in businesses throughout our community, our country, and the world. Guide them, Lord, with your spirit. We lift up the marginalized, Father, those living on the edge every day, and for the church and organizations who continue to care for them despite the added challenges of the virus. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the staff and the lay leaders of St. Andrews who continue to explore innovative ministry. And we thank you for our partner ministries like Dahlia Grove, LHCC, and Lowe's and Fishes, who all continue to adapt and to serve, continue to inspire. We pray for open eyes as we seek opportunities to sow seeds of your past faithfulness in our own hearts for the strengthening of our faith and in the lives of others as a testimony to you. And may your peace, which passes understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, now and in the days ahead. Amen. Well, welcome back, friends. Uh, we've talked a lot this evening about faithfulness, and so to close, we are going to sing one of the great hymns of faith, Great is Thy Faithfulness. I want to just invite you while you're singing these well-known words and this well-known tune that you just meditate on God's well-known goodness and faithfulness to you.
Friends, as you go forth and to the rest of this week, just ask that you keep these words from the book of Jude close to your heart. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forever. Amen.